Hello, um, my name is Ron Dimmick, and I'm a IP litigation partner in the Galilean WLG Law Office in Toronto, Canada. It is my pleasure today to have the Right Honourable Lord Newberger of Abbotsbury as my guest for the next half hour or so. He is also known as Baron Newberger, but today I will call him David. Welcome, David, and thank you for joining me. Also, good to be here, Ron. Okay, very good. Now, um, you and I share early career paths, it seems. Um, we both took science at university in the 1960s. Uh, you read chemistry at, uh, at Oxford, um, and I took engineering mathematics at Queen's. We are both geeks and nerds, I would suppose, uh, with no thought whatsoever about going into law. But eventually we did find our way and we both entered the practice of law in 1974 at the same time. But that's when any similarities in our respective careers ended. <laughs> uh, you um, had a stellar law career as a barrister for 22 years, then a judge for 21, and now for the last three years, a lawyer in private practice again. In the judiciary, you were a high court judge, an appellate judge, then the youngest judge in the House of Lords, then master of the roles in the Court of Appeal, and then, if that were not enough, you were appointed and served as president, or what we would call the chief judge of the UK Supreme Court for five years from 2012 to 2017. David, after all that, what are you doing now that you're back in private practice? Well, there's a convention that you don't go back to the bar and practice in court after you've been a judge. I don't think it's legally enforceable, but I think once you've been a judge for 21 years, uh, you would be very ill-advised to try your hand at advocacy. So I'm back in practice, but the great majority of my work is as, a, as an arbitrator, a bit as a legal expert, independent expert, um, a bit as a mediator, and then a bit giving some second opinions and views of English law and foreign litigation. Well, um, do you miss the bench now that you're back at the bar, so to speak? Either I've been remarkably lucky in my career, or I've been remarkably lucky in my temperament, or both. <laughs> but I, each stage of my career I've really enjoyed, and each stage that I've moved on to, I've enjoyed as well. I do look back at being a judge and looking at some of the cases that the Supreme Court has got at the moment, or has decided, and felt it would have been fun to be there. It would have been an interesting case to do. So I do miss it to that extent. But as I say, I'm lucky enough to have a busy time now and um, a happy temperament normally. Um, and, um, I, <laughs> I can, I can say what most I'm of doing. the time. <laughs> I can I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And I'm just very lucky to be able to be keeping busy now. Probably if I was more sane, I'd have a dignified leisurely retirement. But at the moment, I'm enjoying being busy. Well, that's, uh, that's good to hear. And uh, I always thought, whenever I've been with you, your temperament has been very, very uh, low and, and mellow and, and, uh, and not anything one, what, 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 what one might expect uh, from a, a lord. Um, <laughs> I don't know if my wife and children would agree, but anyway. <laughs> um, do you prefer being an arbitrator uh, to a judge? Uh, are there some aspects of it that uh, you enjoy more or less as the case may be? I think the attraction of being a judge, particularly a senior judge, is that you do get to try some particularly interesting and potentially important and legally difficult cases. As an arbitrator, I, I find the cases very interesting and rewarding, but the points of law tend to be more specific contractual interpretation, what was said, that sort of thing. Um, on the other hand, um, the 
it's very odd when you when you when you cease being a, a a a trial judge in the uk like in canada i think you you stop hearing witnesses and you're very relieved not to hear witnesses <laughs> but after 15 years of sitting as a judge not hearing witnesses i'm very pleased to be hearing witnesses again <laughs> and you are more involved with the parties as an arbitrator than you are as a judge and that's fun and you have different people you're sitting with as an arbitrator, whereas particularly in the Supreme Court, you tend to be sitting with the same people. Much as I like them, um, it's interesting to have the, the, the diversity. So, and then I have to admit, not the most attractive point, but you get paid more as an arbitrator than you do as a judge, which, if I'm honest, is another attraction. Um, I've heard it said from you that uh, one good piece of advice that you received about becoming an arbitrator was from a, a judge who had become an arbitrator and his advice was do not sit above the fray and you shouldn't be too judgy to quote <laughs> that's right i i think it, it's quite difficult to get it right but um i think you are how much you try not to be as a judge, after being sitting in court year after year with people being polite and respectful and laughing at your jokes, you, <laughs> you, you tend, to, and also the nature of the job you're performing, a public function which is responsible, however hard you try, it can go to your head a bit. You are somewhat remote, you are conscious that you are occupying an office which requires you to be, you can be friendly, but it does require a degree of remoteness, a degree. I suppose of superiority in some ways. As an arbitrator, you don't quite have that. You are appointed by the parties. You're part of a contractual arrangement, um, and you mustn't be too judgy. That's, that's quite right. <laughs> I, I, I'm fortunate that that comes to. I think maybe I deceive myself. It comes to me reasonably easily. <laughs> well, that seems to be the case. Um, our audience today, uh, David. Uh, uh, has a special interest in intellectual property law and particularly patent law. Um, and one of your closest colleagues, as I uh, understand it, and best friends uh, that you had when you started off as a high court judge in the Transfer Division in, in, in the late 1990s was Sir Nicholas Pumphrey, uh, a well-respected patent judge then and throughout all the time he was on the bench. Uh, did uh, Sir Nicholas, uh, steer your interest in IP uh, uh, and to hear IP cases? When I became a judge, I had never seen a patent in my life. <laughs> I had no experience. Oh, you, my, oh my so patent. lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and they were short of patent judges. Up till then, almost all patent judges had been um, at, specializing in patents. There had been exceptions like uh, Lenny Hoffman, an exceptionally able judge, who took to patents very quickly. But they were casting around for another judge to do patents. And they discovered, as you've mentioned, that I had a chemistry degree. So I was um, appointed a patents judge. And it was a very steep learning curve. And I think I, I seriously would have been worried about my capability to cope if I hadn't been lucky enough to be in the court under Nick. And I would go up to Nick for advice and assistance um, in patent cases. And nobody could have been more helpful, more prepared to give up his time to help me on this. He didn't tell me the answers, but he explained to me the concept. He explained to me as where to look and so on. And I have to admit, on a couple of cases, he did check my judgments just to make sure that I wasn't talking complete nonsense, hadn't missed <laughs> some obvious point or got some terminology wrong. And um, apart from being enormously fond of Nick, I'm enormously grateful to him for the help he gave me. Um, and and, uh, and uh, I understand that uh, you didn't hear your first patent or, or IP case until you had been on the bench for three years. What case was that, uh, David? Well, I, I think I, I, I think the first case I heard uh, was what Nick always warned me were what seemed the easiest but are the most difficult, which was a mechanical patent. And I'm, I'm trying, it was either a patent involving some sort of met metal working 
or it was a case involving a, a patent for uh, infringement of a patent um, for laying tarmac. The two were around the same time and I can't remember which came first. Okay. But one was unusual, it was the first fully fledged patent case held, held outside London in Birmingham. So Birmingham ah. and I both came to patent cases rather late. <laughs> um, did not being a, a patent lawyer uh, or an IP lawyer to begin with uh, affect the way you approached uh, hearing and deciding IP cases and particularly uh, patent cases? It undoubtedly had, a, had disadvantages. I mean, the, the analogy I, I, I gave to the, the, the patent practitioners when I spoke to them after three years of being a patents judge was that they and I were both on top of a hill. And for them, the whole of the landscape, the whole of patent law was in full sunlight. For me, it was complete darkness. But <laughs> if I had a case on a particular point, it was as if a searchlight had come on and illuminated a small part of the landscape. And the advantage of being a judge and experienced lawyer is that you understand how to concentrate on that bit of the landscape. You do understand and can pick up um, the points that are involved because that's part of your um, culture and experience. But the disadvantage is that you don't necessarily see where the case lies and what the implications of your decisions are in the overall context. Um, and the advantage is, of course, that in theory, at any rate, you bring a fresh mind. There's an element of um, emperor's new clothes. You're the boy who says, but why do you always do this? isn't what the statute says and sometimes you're shown to be talking complete nonsense and it is what the statute says you've misread it but on other occasions there is something in the innocent question from the person who comes fresh to the topic that's, that's interesting I, i've experienced that uh, with uh, judges who were uh, here patent cases here in canada who have had no patent law experience uh, um, you, you get uh, some good points in, in either case, someone with the experience or someone with, without. Um, but uh, I understand the, the most difficult case you ever decided was a patent case. Um, and that was the Kieran Amgen uh, and, and Rose uh, case that uh, you heard as the trial judge. I guess it was... 20 years ago at the start of the millennium. And it was a patent case that went all the way to the House of Lords. And uh, uh, why do you say it was uh, the most difficult case you ever tried? I think it, it may or may not have been the most difficult case I tried. The reason that I think I could have described it as that was because it lasted 30 days and of those days, probably 25 days were evidence. There was quite a number of points to be decided, which obviously were connected, but which were different, discrete points of principle relating to um, science. There was an awful, I'd, a Nobel Prize winner giving evidence on, expert evidence on each side. Um, there was an awful lot of material to go through and I'd been a patent judge for probably a year or so, two years possibly at the most, and it was all very new territory to me. Um, and while, as I say, I'm slightly hesitating to say it definitely was the most difficult case I did, it probably was when you add all the implications together. Um, and maybe I should have stayed being a scientist rather than becoming a lawyer because by the time we got to the House of Lords they were very polite about my description of the science but not quite so polite about my analysis of the law. Yes, uh, uh, it seemed that uh, Lord Hoffman uh, thought you had it wrong, got it wrong and, uh, and uh, found uh, that there was no infringement when in fact you had found infringement at the trial and it was a, a patent as, as I've read on and genetic engineering of erythropolitan, the, the protein that uh, stimulates the production of red blood cells. Um, 
Um, yes, I often think of it as the acronym case because there was wonderful confusion because erythropoietin, the, as you say, the substance which was basically the subject matter of the case, uh, it was known everywhere as EPO, but to patent lawyers, EPO means the European Patent Office. <laughs> so that was another source of confusion, particularly to an, a tarot, to an, a new boy like me. Yes, well, we, are, we have in Canada the CPO. All um, oh, right. <laughs> um, now, um, Sir Hugh Laddie, another uh, well respected uh, patent judge. Yeah. 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 And uh, he referred to the Katnick case, uh, which was decided in the early 1980s by Lord Diplock uh, in the House of Lords, where purpose of construction um, of patent claims was proclaimed to be the law of the land. Sir Hugh described it this way, that, uh, that Katnick was the penultimate step on the road to the adoption of a narrow unforgiving approach to the determination of the scope of protection, namely infringement, and that the ultimate step was the decision of Lord Hoffman and Kiran Amgen, 20 years after Katnick. That comes from Sir Hugh's instructive article entitled Kiran Amgen, The End of, an, of Equivalence. For some, it sounds like a title to a Don Henley song, but... Uh, <laughs> But in any event, you refer to that article in your activist and living decision, which we'll come to in a moment. In your view, David, was Sir Hugh right about Katnick and Kieran Amgen uh, having led to a narrow and unforgiving approach to infringement? Yes, I mean, it, 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 it was. In English law, we had, as I see it, to misuse the expression equivalence, made an equivalence between interpretation and infringement. In other words, if the patent said was limited to X, then you didn't infringe unless you did X. And the fact you did something very close to X or the equivalent of X didn't matter because it wasn't within X. And that was the effect of where we got to with um, um, with Kieran with Kieran Amgen in the in the in the House of Lords. Well, we'll, we'll come to um, your case in Activist and Lily, but did you think back in the in the early two thousands that about fifteen years later, after you'd got uh, Lord Hoffman's decision, that you'd have a chance to decide and proclaim? a different approach to patent protection? Did I think I'd do that when I um, was, when, when I saw his decision in... in, in yeah, in, did you ever think you'd have a chance to reverse it? <laughs> no, I, I, it never crossed my mind. I, I'm not sure, uh, others will have to decide, I'm not sure whether, I, whether our decision reversed it, but you're quite right to say uh, that it um, effectively it said things have moved on. We didn't disagree with Lord Hoffman about the interpretation of, of, of patents. Right. We disagreed with him about infringement. And to be fair to him and me, um, I think the reason we disagreed with him was because the European Patent uh, Convention had effectively introduced the doctrine of equivalence right. yep. um, in a agreement which wasn't in force when Kieran Amgen was decided, although it's fair to say that um, Lord Hoffman was pretty unenthusiastic about it in some comments. Yeah. But well, that, it, was, that was how we did it. Now, um, that the, uh, the case I'm referring to, and you, you talked about a bit, the activist and Libby case yes. was when you decided in the Supreme Court uh, in 2017 uh, just before you retired from that court. Uh, did that case hasten your decision to retire? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I, I have to say that, referring back to a question you asked me a moment ago, I didn't want to retire. If I'd been able to stay, I would have stayed for a few years longer if I could. 
Um, I'm not sorry now in retrospect that I didn't, although in some ways I'm sorry, but I, um, I, I had to go at 70 and um, I became 70 in January 2018 and our legal year begins in October. And I thought I should go at the beginning of the legal year starting October 17. And um, that's really why I went. An activist certainly didn't hasten my my go. No. <laughs> well, it, it's 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 nice to be seventy. That's I can say that uh, from my own experience. Well, I'm, the only way you don't get to seventy is rather unpalatable. So I'm quite <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. no, um, the uh, the uh, court in activists sat uh, as num as five. The, the usual number, as I understand it, although there are eleven uh, on your court. Um, can you sit with a greater number than five on, on, on any appeals? You, there, are, there are in fact 12, but you, you can't sit more, you only have to sit odd numbers, say you're right, you couldn't yeah. have more than 11. Um, we sit, the, the Supreme Court sits five regularly, seven on cases where we might reverse another case or where it's important, nine in very exceptional cases, and on two cases it's been 11. And the, the one case with eleven was the was the, had to do with the Brexit issue, but both 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 have been to do have raised important constitutional issues arising directly or indirectly out of Brexit. That's quite right. No, um, it's uh, it's interesting that decades ago uh, in Canada, all the judges of the Supreme Court of Canada sat on every patent appeal to that court. Okay nine in number, even though they could sit on such appeals with less than a full bench. Mm -hmm. Apparently, they wanted to spread the misery around. <laughs> 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 and uh, does the president of the United Kingdom Supreme Court uh, have to call for volunteers on patent cases or are they interested uh, nonetheless? I, 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 it may have changed, although I very much doubt it has. The, the president of the court together with the deputy president decides normally who should sit on which cases and how many people should sit. Um, and um, the drafting is, um, is, is of, the, of the list is, some, is normally done by the registrar and then the president and deputy president consider it, make amendments and so on. Occasionally you've got people you rarely got people saying, do I have to sit on this? But you occasionally got people who one way or another would be saying, can I sit on one? I'm not. Right. not. <laughs> and you did try and, did try and sort of allocate it fairly so that everyone had their share of less interesting cases and everyone had their share of more interesting cases. Yeah. Now, um, I'll just ask a few questions about the uh, activist case and then move on. But... Uh, According to Lord Kitchen, who's now on that court, in a more recent case when he was in the Court of Appeal, uh, in a case called Icecapes, as I recall, he wrote that you introduced in activists a markedly different approach to deciding patent infringement than had been implied in the United Kingdom previously. Is that a fair assessment? I think it is. Um, yes, I, I think we, I would say we acknowledged the rules as they've been developed in the European Patent Convention and a protocol which had been amended um, and which introduced in, in our view um, effectively the doctrine of equivalence. The advantage of the Lenny Hoffman rule, the advantage of the rule that Hugh Laddie wasn't very keen on, was that it's a usual problem in, in, in law, was that it was certain. You knew what the patent said and either you were within the words of the patent or you weren't. And if you were within the words, you infringed. And if you weren't, you didn't. Yeah. What we developed, I say as a result of the protocol, was that um, the doctrine of equivalence did have an application. And therefore, even if you weren't within the words of the patent, you could still infringe. The advantage of that is that it's more just. It catches calculated infringements that just avoid the words but it does introduce more uncertainty into the law. Um, so 
but uh, but uh, the short answer to your question is we did change the laws. It was understood to be yeah. And and, and another change, as I understand, uh, uh, and we've had that had that uh, this other change introduced to our law by way of uh, statutory amendment. But uh, you in the common law uh, admitted evidence or took account of evidence from the patent prosecution file uh, as, as to when it might affect the assessment of equivalence. And uh, in, in the activist case, you found that uh, uh, such evidence would not uh, affect uh, your assessment of equivalence. Um, I, think, I think we said sometimes judges are the worst guide to their own decisions. I think we said that normally you shouldn't look at the prosecution file, but occasionally you could. And if you could in this case, it nonetheless didn't make any difference. Yeah. But you may be right. I... Well, um, <laughs> I do have to, uh, to, to... I should have done my homework for this interview better. Mike. Well, it, it's, it's quite all right. Uh, um, some say, and, and, and I know there was a heated debate after your decision came down, that uh, some thought that the balance uh, was, uh, or that uh, the activist case decision swayed the balance too far in favor of the patentee. Um, and there was, a, there was a debate in one way or the other and, and, and so on. Um, do you accept that characterization or, uh, or is, I think the patent system has to be fair to, to both sides, uh, the, the public and the inventor for having disclosed a, a, a meritorious invention. Uh, but uh, uh, here in Canada, uh, my view is that uh, it's very difficult to prove infringement now with purpose of instruction and so on. Uh, but uh, did, uh, did the activist case turn it more too far in favor of the patentee, do you think? I think it's, it's, it's I, I, I'm not really able competently to answer. I mean, one of the problems which I did identify in another case uh, in the Supreme Court is that really what the test should be is defined by lawyers and what the test should be in the public interest should not be a matter of law. It's more a matter of economics or social justice, call it what you will. And in a case we had involving how far you had to have enabled something before you could patent it, um, that issue seemed to me to be very much a question of what was economically fair and realistic. And that's not quite how the, the legal rules are based on that. But once you've set the legal rule, you then apply the rule rather than look at what's fair. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do not think that activist is the last word in English law. I think on the topic, A, because there's never a last word, but B, <laughs> if there was, I think either somebody will say it's wrong or they'll tweak it, or they will develop and explain the idea of precisely what the tests are for equivalence. Right. Now, um, let's talk a bit about, uh, so we've talked about the past, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the future and maybe the recent past. Uh, a mere six weeks ago, your former court, the United Kingdom uh, Supreme Court, uh, issued its decision in on a standard essential patent to uh, yeah. and, and Fran, uh, F-R-A-N-D, in unwired patents, uh, Planet and, and Huawei. Um, and there uh, the Supreme Court said that uh, it had jurisdiction to grant an injunction if a party infringes a standard uh, essential patent, uh, but refuses a, a Fran, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory license available from the patentee to practice the invention of that patent. Uh, so uh, that seems to be an indication, as you've said, that uh, uh, your former court is keen on advancing the law of intellectual property and particularly patents, uh, having taken that, that on for appeal. Um, and, and as I understand it, Lord Kitchen, uh, one of the barristers for the defendant in the here in Amgen case, uh, is now on uh, the House, is now in the United Kingdom Supreme Court, 
So it's apparent that patents and uh, IP cases will continue to be welcomed in that court. Um, here's my sort of final question. Um, what key patent issues uh, uh, do you see developing and being litigated in the courts in the foreseeable future? Well, so far as what I, 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 I'm not sure I can actually pontificate about what types of patents. Clearly, there are going to be a lot on, I suspect, depending on what advances are made in the pharmaceutical industry, particularly post-COVID. Um, there may be quite a lot there. Um, I suspect, um, as the, uh, as, uh, as you say, the uh, standard patent case, the Huawei and Unwired Planet case shows, there'll probably be quite a lot of litigation about that. Maybe that's been put to sleep by, um, by the decision of the Supreme Court. But I think more generally what the decision of the Supreme Court there, the issue there shows, is that not merely are we in a much more international world generally, but when it comes to IP, we are in a particular, the, the international aspects are particularly demanding. And I think the Huawei case was an indication of the desirability, if one could, of having more international type courts and international law, um, or international law in the sense of um, national laws that are connected and consistent with each other, um, because the Supreme Court was in the end faced with two choices. One was, in general terms in that case, one was saying that really uh, all we can do is to fix the position in the UK and leave um, everybody to sort out the appropriate rates in their own jurisdictions, which would have largely destroyed the purpose of FRAND. Or they found themselves in a position of fixing rates across the world uh, which was an extreme jurisdiction, but at least gave them, gave FRAND its intended effect. But the problem, of course, is if other countries do the same thing, you get the <laughs> inconsistent decisions. And I think it's, it's a, the FRAND, whole of FRAND is an example of the desirability of having some sort of system for internationalizing or at least ensuring a degree of consistency between the laws of uh, the patent laws and IP laws of different countries. The sort of thing that is easy to say, but is extremely difficult to achieve. Yes, uh, the harmonization of patent laws has uh, been sought right. for, for decades. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, even within Europe, the attempt to have a European EU patent court is sort of sputtering along. Mm -hmm. But it's been going for years. If you can't even get it within the EU, that already linked together with courts. Well, but some sort of accord, some sort of understanding, some sort of a, a, agreement would, I think, even if it's limited, be highly desirable. <coughs> but maybe it's asking for the moon. <laughs> well, we we'll shoot for the stars and, and, and get to the moon. Um, and now we're shooting for Mars. But uh, uh, <laughs> David, uh, I'm grateful to you. Uh, and I'm sure uh, so is our audience for your spending time with me today and having a lively conversation about uh, law, IP law, and your perspectives on it. Uh, thank you very much, David. Thank you. Very good to talk.